Let's take our Bibles tonight and open up to Deuteronomy chapter 28. Deuteronomy chapter 28 to start. Um, preacher used this verse on Sunday and uh, we'll read just two verses here to start. And Preacher read these two verses on Sunday. If you remember the message he preached about joy. <clears throat> and it occurred to me that there are times in our Christian lives when we desire to pursue after God, but we forget that somebody else is pursuing after us. And that as much as we might want God, the devil doesn't want us to have God. And so tonight I want to look at some things with this thought in mind as the consequence for what happens when we let, allow the devil to have a victory in our lives. So let's read verses 47 and 48, and then we'll turn over to Exodus, and we'll pray while we're turning there. But just let's read Deuteronomy 28, verses 47. It says, Because thou servest not the Lord thy God with joyfulness and with gladness of heart for the abundance of all things, therefore shalt thou serve thine enemies, which the Lord shall send against thee, in hunger and in thirst and in nakedness and in want of all things, and he shall put a yoke of iron upon thy neck until he have destroyed thee. Brother Mitch, would you pray and ask God to bless it? Amen. Um, while you're sitting, if you'll turn over to Exodus chapter 5, Exodus chapter 5, um, and we'll look at what I've titled this message called The Devil's Battle Plan. Um, first off, before I get into it, let me say thank you for your prayers. The building is going very well, uh, as most of you can see right now. Um, they should finish up the roof in the next day or so. And Lord willing, they'll start putting trim on the inside of the vertical walls, the parapet wall it's called. And so maybe, I doubt by Sunday you'll see much trim up, but by following Sunday you should see some trim pieces going on, and Lord willing, you'll start to see some canopies. And uh, maybe by the middle to end of June, the metal guys will be completely finished with the shell. So Lord willing, keep praying, and um, things go smoothly. We should have a shell up by the end of June. So thank you for your prayers, and it's, it is amazing and an honor to be a part of that project. Um, it, it is amazing to see what God continues to do over there and how he continues to provide every step of the way. Um, I know preachers said it before, so I'm not saying anything he hasn't said, but that building is 100% paid for, Amen. and we haven't had to borrow a dime to get anywhere to where we are with that building. Amen. And it's not, and it's, the cool thing about it is, is it's a lot like your walk with the Lord, is that... The, the Lord will give you the next step, but he won't give you the next two steps. And I have seen that in this building time and time again. I'm like, Lord, I'm trying to plan out a construction schedule. I'm trying to plan out and, you know, if you would just provide all the money right now, then I could really get a good construction schedule going. And the Lord's like, I don't, I'm not worried about your schedule. I'm worried about mine. And it's kind of like our Christian lives a lot of the time, ain't it? The Lord's like, you just follow my schedule and I'll get you where I want you to go. Don't worry about what your schedule is. And a lot of times in a Christian life, we decide we want to pursue after Jesus Christ. We decide we want, to, we, we want to have the joy that Preacher was talking about. We want to have our joy be our strength and be able to stand up and walk with the Lord and have fellowship with the Lord on a regular basis. But we don't have the power within ourselves to do it. And we place unrealistic expectations upon ourselves to attain something that we don't have the ability to attain yet. Clearly, I have not been in a gym recently, but years ago, I used to work out on a somewhat regular basis. And what I learned about working out in the gym is, when you first go in, if you've never lifted any weight at all, you don't really gain muscle really, really quickly. 
It takes time and time and time and time. But if you've been in the gym, gotten out of the gym, and go back to the gym, you have what, a thing called muscle memory. And it's easier for you to get back to the place where you were a little bit faster. Now, you can't just walk into the gym one day and lift 225 if you haven't been lifting for six or eight months. You still got to go through the progression, but you can get there a little bit quicker. You can, you can get back to that place a little bit quicker than if you've never been there before. But sometimes in our, and the illustration I'm trying to make to you is this, is in our Christian lives, sometimes we fall out of fellowship and we want to get right back to where we were, but you can't just get right back to where you were. There are some steps that you have to go to and you have to follow along the way to get back to the place you left. You can't just, when you walk away from the Lord, the Lord doesn't, stop moving he continues to move so guess what you have to catch up to where he is you have to get back in fellowship with him so you can't just i'm in perfect fellowship right here i'm not in perfect fellowship and now i'm in perfect fellowship no he's already taken two more steps and i've got to catch up to where he is and so sometimes in our christian lives we put this unrealistic expectation that the moment i choose to pursue the lord the more the moment i choose to just pour my life into my walk with the lord that everything is going to fall into place and that the Lord is going to honor it and everything is going to go perfectly. And it never works that way. I mean, the very first time you try to pursue after the Lord, something always happens. You get busy, life happens. You, I mean, the kids get sick, the wife gets sick, the car breaks down, your boss asks you to work extra hours, you need some overtime because you got to pay some bills. Stuff just happens. And so what I want to look at tonight is to, is to show you why some of that stuff happens and why some of those things occur in our life. And it's because there's an opposition. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's not like that we are fighting a one-sided battle. We have, we have somebody we're fighting against. We have three people we're fighting against. We're fighting against the world, the flesh, and the devil. They're not wimps. They, they don't just give up the moment you say in Jesus' name and stop pursuing you and stop fighting after you. The moment you are laying in the box here in front of the church, the battle's over with. But until then, the battle doesn't stop. And they're going to continue to pursue you. So look there in Exodus chapter 5, and what I want to show you is five things the devil will ask of you when you get ready to pursue the Lord. Look there in Exodus chapter 5 and verse number 1. It says, And afterward Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. And they said, and they said The God of the Hebrews hath met with us. Let us go, we pray thee, three days' journey into the desert, and sacrifice unto the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with a sword. And the king of Egypt said unto them, Wherefore do ye, Moses and Aaron, let the people from their works get you to your burdens? And Pharaoh said, Behold, the people of the land now are many, and ye make them rest from their burdens. And Pharaoh commanded the same day taskmasters of the people and their officers, saying, Ye shall give them no more straw to make brick as heretofore. Let them go and gather the straw. So the first thing the devil's going to say to you is get back to work. He's going to say, You've got a job to do. You have responsibilities. You need to get back to work. And what I have found in my Christian life is when I have fallen by the wayside and I've not been in fellowship, the people around me sometimes don't necessarily know how important my walk with the Lord is to me. And the minute I begin to talk about the Lord and pursue after the Lord, they go, who is the Lord? I've never heard you talk about the Lord before. Why is it a big deal all of a sudden for you to be talking about the Lord? And they begin to question you and question why, why is it I've watched you do this, I've watched you tell this joke, I've watched you say these words, I've watched you, you've listened to the same things I've listened to, you've watched the same videos on YouTube I've watched, you've done all of these things, why all of a sudden is it important for you to follow God? Just go back to work, go back to what you were doing, stay where you were at, you weren't, you weren't rocking the boat, don't stir a trouble, everything will be just fine, just get back to where you were. And that's the temptation of your flesh. Your flesh is like, why do I, I mean, really... I mean, church on a Wednesday night, I mean, I, I mean, man, do you know how hard it's been this week? I mean, I could really just prop my feet up tonight and just tune in and it'd be all right. Or, you know what, I really just need to go to bed early tonight. 
just, just, just get back to work. Just, just go back to work. Just stay there. Keep working. It'll be okay. Don't worry about where you're at. He says, get back to work. He also tells them to get back to the old ways. He says, get to your burdens. You know, there's, there's this... You ever started pursuing God and all of a sudden you realize there are some things that you've left undone? You begin to pursue God and all of a sudden the grass needs to be mowed? You know, your closet that you haven't cleaned out in five years, you find 30 minutes that, well, I'll, man, it'd be a great time for me to clean the closet out right now instead of reading my Bible. I mean, God gave me the closet. I need to be a good steward of what God's given me, so I better get in there and take care of what's God given me. You know, I may find $100,000 in the bottom of that closet. Name it and claim it. Ain't that what Brother Sam just said? You know, I'm going to empty the closet out and we're going to pay the mortgage off. Praise the Lord. And, but, but that happens to you. All of a sudden, you know what? I haven't washed the car in days. And all of a sudden, you find this, this window of opportunity to sit down in fellowship with the Lord or take care of some responsibilities. You've neglected the responsibilities all week long, but in the moment that you find the opportunity, man, I really should take care of this because the car, you know, I mean, it's, it hadn't rained in like three weeks, so I probably should go wash it now. You know, and, the, and I don't know about you, but if it hasn't rained in three weeks, the moment I, the moment I wash my car, it's going to rain. So just don't wash it. The Lord will let it, the Lord will wash it here soon enough. But that's what the devil tries to say to you. He says, look, God gave you all of these things. You have a responsibility to take care of these things. You should take care of what God, God gave you to take care of. Maybe God didn't give it to you. Maybe your flesh gave it to you. Maybe the devil allowed you to have it because they knew it would distract you from what really mattered in life. They knew that it would take your attention off of following Jesus Christ because they knew you'd have to take care of it. You know, there, there, is, there is something... Uh, there, there is something about not having a lot of stuff because it allows you the opportunity to have more time on your hands. When you have a lot of stuff, you spend a lot of time taking care of stuff. When we get to heaven, God's not going to ask you, how do you take care of your stuff? I mean, don't get me wrong. If you have a car, you should take care of a car. If you have a home, you should take care of your home. But... We spend so, much, so many hours caring for our flesh and caring for our own desires that we don't care for our walk with Jesus Christ. Amen. And that's all the devil's interested in us doing is just get off one little degree. Just do, it, it's a good thing at the wrong time. It, right. it, how many times have you heard a preacher preach on that? It is a good thing at a wrong time. You have this window of opportunity to sit down and talk with the Lord, pray a little bit, read your Bible a little bit, listen to some preaching a little bit. But you know what? Man, that kitchen drawer hadn't been emptied out in months. I, I mean, nobody's home. I should, you know, it's a great opportunity to clean the kitchen drawer out. I mean, my wife won't know what's missing in there. I can just dump it in the trash can. And when she comes home, it'll be surprised and it'll be wonderful. You missed an opportunity. You're going to take a tongue lashing too for dumping the drawer out in the trash can. At least I know I would. Maybe you don't. But you remember the verse Brother Sam mentioned in, in Bible study in Matthew 12 about the, the, the guy that went out and left and the, cast out the devil and he found the, the, the... Turn over to Luke 11. I know you had it in Matthew 12, but now turn over to Luke 11. My mind is running faster than my mouth will keep up. It says in Wendy, Matthew 11, verse 24... It says, when the unclean spirit has gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest and finding none. He saith, I will return unto my house from whence, I, from whence I came out. And when he cometh, he find it swept and garnished. Then goeth he and taketh him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. That is, I, I understand where that fits doctrinally, but practically speaking, that is what we do in our Christian lives. We decide to pursue Jesus Christ. We, did, we get all clean. We get all fessed up. But then we don't put anything back in its place. We don't put the right things back inside. We don't put Jesus Christ back in our heart. We don't put Jesus Christ back in the forefront of our mind. We don't, we don't make our walk with the Lord, the Lord the most important part of our life. We take and put in, we take and get everything cleaned up, get it all shined up, and just make it look pretty. But we don't put the right stuff back in. 
If you don't put the right stuff back in, sooner or later you're going to put the wrong stuff back in. If you're so focused on putting the right stuff in, you don't have to worry about putting the wrong stuff in. When I'm reading my Bible and talking with the Lord, I'm not really interested in watching an R-rated movie on television. I'm not really interested in watching whatever the late, latest YouTube craze is on the internet. I'm not really interested in what somebody said in the news today or what happened in the news today because I'm filled up with the right stuff. I've, I've got something that, that will last, that will feed me, that will nourish me beyond anything else. It is amazing to me the, the fulfillment that reading the Word of God gives to you and I. It is amazing to me what this book will give us that the world can't give us. Amen. And yet so oftentimes, it is, not even so oftentimes, it is just easier to let the world fill us up than it is to sit down and tell your flesh no. Sure. Because it's a battle, folks. It, I'm, I'm not making light of this. I'm not saying this is easy. But it is a battle to, to make yourself sit down, tell your flesh, shut up, yep. and just read your Bible. Yep. It, it is hard. It is not an easy thing. We live in a world today that, that it is, we are weird, we are a peculiar people, he says in 1 Peter 2. We are just different. But, and it, but if you're going to have anything at the judgment seat of Christ, you've got to be comfortable being weird. Yep. Yeah. You've got to be comfortable being different than everybody else in the entire world. Yeah. And know that, you know what? Yeah, the world's out there pursuing things. The world's getting back to work. The world's gathering straw. The world's gathering something that's going to be burned up at the judgment seat of Christ. They're going to, they're going to face something at the great white throne judgment, and it's going to be completely burned up, and they have nothing to show. And God's going to say, depart from me, you curse and everlasting wickedness, into, into, into fire and hell. I don't want to see that happen to any of us in this church. I realize, I'm, and I know you can't go to hell, but I don't want to see any of us in this church get to the judgment seat of Christ and not have something to offer back to our Savior. Amen. To sit here in this church underneath the preaching you hear from our preacher and brother Sam, to sit here and not have anything to offer back to him will be a greater disgrace to have sat in any charismatic church here in Jacksonville and been completely clueless. Sure. Because you'll have an opportunity that many other people never had. God is going to hold you to a higher standard and a, more, and a larger accountability because of the information that you and I have been given. What are you doing with the information? And the, the problem is, is the devil just wants us to get back to work. Just, just get back to pursuing your career. Listen, there's nothing wrong with being a great businessman. There's nothing wrong with being a great doctor, a great nurse, a great lawyer. Whatever it is you do, a great police officer... If you're a Christian and you're in the world working, you should be the best at your job of everybody else. But too often times we use our job as an excuse to not pursue Jesus Christ. I'm, I'm busy working on my career. I'll get to Jesus when I have time. How many of our children are not going to get to Jesus because we're busy pursuing our own careers? The devil first says, get back to work. He tells you to get your own straw. Turn over to Exodus chapter 8. Exodus chapter 8, verse number 25. And Pharaoh called for Moses and for Aaron and said, Go ye sacrifice to your God in the land. Pharaoh says, Hey, worship, but don't leave where you are. Just... Worship from the comfort of your own position right now. You don't need to get out of the world to worship God. I mean, he, the Pharaoh's saying, hey, listen, just, just stay right there in Goshen. Set up your altars. Sacrifice right there in the comfort of where you are and worship God. It'll be all right for you to worship God right where you are. I mean, what's the big deal? I can worship God. I mean, God created all of nature. I can worship God when I'm in nature. I mean, I've, I personally, I've stood on the side of the mountain and prayed and felt the presence of God standing on the side of a mountain. So why can't I just have church on the side of a mountain every Sunday? I mean, I, I love going to the mountains. I love seeing the animals. You drop me off in the woods for a couple of weeks, and I'd be perfectly fine with no cell phone and nobody around for a few weeks and probably come back a saner individual. But you can't continue to worship God there all the time. You have to be in the place God wants you to be. You have to be willing to go to the place that God wants you to go. That's what amazes me about this church 
is the number of people that drive from so far to get to this place. And what people have done to move here to get to be a part of this place. Because you can't find this place anywhere else in the world. I, I mean, listen, there are some other great churches, there are some other great preachers, but there's no place like this place. And you know what? It's not in a convenient place. Amen. I mean, it's between two main streets in the middle of a neighborhood. It is not easy to get to from pretty much anywhere you live. Now, I know, you know, well, it's easy for us to get here. I used to live in Arlington, and there is no easy way from Arlington to get here. I mean, you either go around your elbow to get here, or you come up through the middle, and it is painful, and there's 900 traffic lights. It's only 12 miles. But it takes 35 minutes. It's not easy. This, I mean, maybe it is. Maybe for y'all this is an easy place to get to. You don't have any problem ever coming to church. I mean, it, you just get in the car, set it on cruise control, and you just pull in the parking lot. I mean, maybe that's how it works for all the rest of y'all, and I'm, I'm the only fool. But for me, it is, never, it is never easy to just get here. And, but that's what the devil wants. The devil wants you to be comfortable worshiping wherever it is you are without having to get to this place where God wants you to be. The devil wants you to be okay worshiping God in a bass boat. He wants you to conform to what most people would... Most, I mean, why is it so important for us to get to church on a Wednesday night? What's the big deal? Do you realize that 95% of churches in the city of Jacksonville don't have a Wednesday night service? They're not even open on a Wednesday night? Most churches right now, because of the pandemic, only have a Sunday morning service. Why, not, why don't we conform to everybody else? Because that ain't what God called us to do. God called us to be different. He called us to be set apart. Be not conformed to this world. You know, I was listening to, the, to Dr. Ruckman the other day um, preach a message from, I think it was the mid-80s. It was either the late 70s or early 80s. And he's preaching a message about the Catholic Church and the Charismatic Church coming together and creating an, ec an ecumenical, ecumenical mess. And I don't know how much you've paid attention, but a lot of charismatic churches, though they may not follow the Pope, they follow all of the other stuff the Catholic Church does. They have Ash Wednesday and put ash on the people's foreheads. They have the Palm Sundays where they make the crosses out of the palms and everybody passes them around. They take communion and they tell you about what the bread and the water is and they use the real wine. They have... They are slowly becoming the same monogamous group. They just worship in two different locations. One of them has a guy in Italy that's their king, and the other guy, I guess, you have to see Jesus in order to be their pope, um, or whatever that is. But, I mean, that, I, I, I know exactly what Brother Sam's talking about. That guy had his vision, and for his Sunday service, I think it was his wife that interviewed him about his vision. And that was the Sunday service. Can you imagine coming here and Mr. and Miss Peacock on the platform and them doing a public interview for a service? We would be outraged. I mean, we, we would be stop talking and get to preaching right now. I don't come here to hear about what you've seen. And he would tell all of us, if I tell you I've seen a 900-foot Jesus, just set me aside Put me in the middle ward and we'll and find somebody else to fill a pulpit. Because ain't nobody seen a 900 foot Jesus. Martin Luther saw a 900 foot Jesus and threw an inkwell at him. You can still go to Germany and see the ink splot on the wall where he threw the thing out because he said it was the devil and it wasn't Jesus. Jesus ain't appearing to us at the foot of the bed anymore, folks. Amen. We're not having visions right now. Right. What we need is a vision for our fellowship with Jesus Christ and following the Lord Jesus Christ Amen. and getting to the place God wants us to be. But the devil says, hey, look, just worship where you are. Stay where you are. Don't separate. Don't be different than everybody else. Look, you can do good deeds in another church. I mean, look at the ministries of, of all of these other places. Look at, look at, I mean, look at, I mean, this church has a single mom's ministry. And this church has a widowed mom's ministry. And this church has a divorced husband's ministry. And this church has an... Uh, indigent ministry and a benevolence ministry and everybody's got a ministry but nobody ever hears any preaching whatsoever Amen. and nobody ever gets fed except their flesh gets fed all they do is take care of people's physical needs but never take care of their spiritual needs 
The reason you come to a place like this is because you want the inner man to get fed, not because you need your flesh to be fed. Well, our flesh gets fed plenty enough. You come here because you want the inner man. You, you want the, the new man to be a little bit stronger than the fleshly man. Amen? Amen. Amen? And the world is saying to you, the devil is saying to you, look, you don't need to be different than everybody else. You don't need to be separate. It's okay for you to look like everybody else. I am thankful that we go to a church that in the middle of a pandemic, we're building a building. When everybody else says you should be downsizing, we're growing. That's because we're doing what God's asked us to do. We're going where God's asked us to go, and we're walking the way God's asked us to walk. Look there down in verse number 28. The, the third thing he says, he says, And Pharaoh said, I will let you go, that you may sacrifice the Lord your God in the wilderness, only you shall not go very far away. Entreat for me. Don't get too carried away. Don't, I mean, okay, you're going to worship. You're going to take it a little more serious than everybody else is. But just don't get carried away. I mean, you don't need to tell everybody else about what you're doing. You know, just, just keep it to yourself. I mean, I mean, it's, you worship, do your thing, but we, I don't need to hear about it. I, I mean, don't, don't pass me a track. Don't tell me about how great your worship service was. Don't tell me about what you read in your Bible this morning. Just, just keep that to yourself. I mean, that's easy to do in this day and age. It is easy to keep it to yourself. Because nobody wants to hear about it. I mean, nobody wants you to knock on their door at all. I mean, there was a time when the front porch in this country mattered and people sat on the front porch and you could have a conversation with somebody walking down the street. Not anymore. You come walking down my driveway, you'd better have a reason to come walking down my driveway. My wife is having me a sign made that says, prepare to meet thy God or turn back now. My driveway is really long. You're not coming to my house for any other reason than I invited you. Um, or you're not there to do anything good. And so, but we live in this place where we're, <clears throat> we're right next door to each other and we never speak to anybody. I mean, I, I'm not a, an outgoing person by nature. I know that may sound weird because I'm standing up here talking this is not comfortable for me. This is not normal for me. I'm not the guy that just walks up to somebody and says, man, let me tell you what God did for me. That just ain't, you know, it, I, it just ain't me. I'm just being honest with you. But I hated wearing masks because I at least try to smile at people when I'm in a store or I'm at the gas station and nod and see if they'll speak to me. If you'll speak to me, I will speak to you. But I'm not going to go out of my way to start conversation. That just ain't who I am. I got stuff to do, but if you speak to me, I'll stop and have a conversation with you. But everybody had these masks on, and I remember being at the gas station one day, and I'm pumping gas on this side. This guy's pumping gas on that side. I, I did not have a mask on. He's wearing his mask. Apparently, the, the gas pump, you know, COVID can jump the gas pump, whatever. I smiled at him. I couldn't see a smile, but I could tell from his eyes he was scowling at me. Like, don't look at me, look away, leave me alone. And when somebody looks at you like that, your first instinct goes, man, let me tell you about Jesus. I mean, that don't just, you know, jump in your mind because with the insanity in the world, you're going, well, I hope the guy doesn't kill me. You know, I hope the guy doesn't stab me. I doesn't pull out a gun for whatever, you know, whatever. I mean, and you immediately begin to think personal safety. And so we live in a day and age where it's easy to just keep it to yourself. It is easy to just keep your walk with the Lord quiet. It is easy to just, you know, not say anything to anybody else and not stir up any trouble. But there comes a time in our Christian life where we have a responsibility to share what God's done for us. There comes a responsibility in our Christian life that if we're going to grow in our walk with the Lord, we have a duty to tell other people how good God's been to us. We can just sit around and get fat spiritually and never tell anybody, or we can exercise ourselves spiritually and share the gospel with somebody else. And I don't mean you got to stop and witness to them, give them the Romans road and all that stuff. But man, you know, somebody sneezes, God bless you. Nobody says God bless you. Everybody says bless you or gesundheit or uh, what's the other one that the English say? I can't think of it right now, but there's, you know, 
nobody says God bless you anymore. Nobody wants to hear the name of God. Nobody wants to hear the name of Jesus Christ unless they're cursing. And I mean, it's, I, I mean I, it is unbelievable to me the number of people that, that say Jesus Christ in a derogatory form, form every, all day long. Like, I, like growing up, like that was, one of, that was the unpardonable sin as a child. If I took the Lord's name in vain, I could guarantee I was getting a whooping for saying Jesus Christ or saying God or saying golly or saying gosh. Like, I was, I was head to the bedroom, son. You know what you said. It's over with. Like, there was no partiality to a slip up every once in a while. So for me, it, in the house I grew up in, you just didn't say those things. But we live in a world today where nobody thinks anything of Jesus Christ other than just to say his name as a curse word and have no idea even who he is as a person other than just to use it as a slur. At some point in time when somebody says Jesus Christ, man, he's, thank God he saved me. I mean, <laughs> thank God for the blood. I mean, you, listen, you want to catch somebody off guard when they, when they use his name, go, hey man, praise the Lord for him. I, I, got, I have guys on a construction site, and I'll go, man, he's good, ain't he? And they're like, what? I'm like, well, you said Jesus' name. I figured you were calling out to him. And they're like, oh, my bad, my bad. I'm like, no, it's okay. You want to talk about it? Let's talk about it. You called on him. I'll answer. You know, it's all good. Let's, let's have a talk. But we should be looking for those opportunities to when somebody else opens the door, open the door. And if they don't, sometimes you need to kick it in. But... We can sit here and get fat spiritually and the devil would be con perfectly content for it to be us four and no more. That's right. That's right. I don't believe that's what God wants for us. I believe he wants us to give it to other people. He wants us to take it too far. He wants us to take it where the world's not comfortable being around us. And we shouldn't be comfortable being in the world. Just like Brother Sam said, in that Brownsville church, he wasn't comfortable sitting up there. It was weird. I don't want to be comfortable in a charismatic church. And I don't want them comfortable with me being there. Amen. It's okay for somebody to be uncomfortable because I know what you're doing is wrong and I don't mind saying what you're doing is wrong. We, shouldn't, we should not feel bad for telling somebody the truth. But you live in a day and age today where if you say somebody, hey, you shouldn't do that, then you're, they make you feel bad for making them feel bad. No, it's not that way. If you're doing wrong, you're doing wrong. What happened to the, to the law and order where if somebody committed a crime, they paid a penalty for it? I mean, we, we're at a, a stage now where, I mean, we are so far beyond every man does that which is right in his own eyes. I mean, we, we have gone to the nth degree to where you can justify anything and it, it is just about legal inside the law except killing somebody else. And in, killing babies is legal in and of itself right now anyway. So I guess you can kill somebody, just somebody who can't speak for themselves. I realize there's not a great revival coming, but it doesn't negate our responsibility to walk with the Lord and show other people what Jesus Christ has done for us. Just because the world's not going to listen doesn't mean we don't have to tell them. But that's what the devil's saying. Listen. Just, okay, go worship, but just don't take it too far. We don't, we don't need to hear about it. We don't need to know about it. We don't, need to be, we don't need to be inundated with your beliefs. We're comfortable just where we are. And the problem is, is it's easy for us to just get comfortable where we are and not push out of our own comfort zone. The fourth thing I want to say is look over in Exodus chapter 10. Exodus chapter 10. Verse number 8 it says, And Moses and Aaron were brought again unto Pharaoh, and he said unto them, Go, serve the Lord your God, but who are they that shall go? And Moses said, We will go with our young, and with our old, and with our sons, and with our daughters, and with our flocks, and with our herds. We will go, and we must hold a feast unto the Lord. And he said unto them, Let the Lord be so with you, this is Pharaoh talking, as I will let you go, and your little ones, Look to it, for evil is before you. Not so, go now, ye that are men, and serve the Lord. For ye that did desire, and they were... Serve the Lord for ye that did desire, and they were driven from out of the presence, Pharaoh's presence. What Pharaoh's telling them is, look, you men, you go worship, 
but leave your wife and kids here. Leave your wife and kids in the world and you go worship. I mean, you men, you're men, you're not, you're not going to be swayed. You go do what you need to go do, but leave your kids here. Let me raise your kids and you go worship God. I don't know about you, but that's what happened in the generation before me is that parents went to church and the 60s raised their kids. And parents went to church and the 70s raised their kids. And parents went to church and the 80s raised their kids. And if you know anything about culture and what happened during the culture of the 60s, 70s, and 80s and the, the, all of the stupid revolutions that everybody had, the cultural revolutions of the 60s, 70s, 80s, is part of the reason the church is in the condition it's in right now. Because parents went to church and their kids stayed home. Mom and dad, you have a responsibility to bring your kids with you. The devil says, you know what? My kids have time to get involved in church. There's time for them to get involved. There's time for them to get involved. They'll grow up one day and they'll want to be a part of this. If you don't make them be a part of it now, they'll never want to desire it later on in their life. Amen. I grew up in a youth group of over 100 kids. And out of 100 kids, there's two of us that are in what I call any sort of ministry at all today. Two out of 100. There are less than 25 that are still in church right now. What happened? Their parents didn't make them walk with the Lord. Their parents didn't show them the importance of walking with the Lord. We ask our kids to get up here and quote Scripture. Mom and Dad, when's the last time you quoted Scripture? When's the last time you said, you know what? I need to know something beyond John 3.16. When's the last time you put a 3 by 5 note card on the, above your steering wheel in your car and read it as you got it out of the car and, and tried to memorize a verse? When's the last time you stuck one on the mirror in your bathroom and said, you know what, I'm going to try to memorize, memorize some more Scripture? I mean, we talk about how important the Word of God is to us. We talk about how important that our fellowship with Jesus Christ is, but are we demonstrating it to our families? Are we demonstrating how important that message is? That how, what we believe, are we sharing it with our children? You know what? There's another passage in Deuteronomy 6 where, where uh, Moses is talking and, and he's telling the children of Israel, God's going to give you all of these things, but all I want you to do is tell your kids. Just tell your kids about me. You know, we tell our kids about all the other things. We, we share about them wisdom of life. We tell them about what they should look for in a job. We tell them how important school is. We tell them how important the things that, they, that you know, if you need to get a good education so you can get a good job, so you can get a nice house, so you can get a nice wife or get a nice husband, you know, whatever it is. And, and we lay out all of the physical things for them, but do we lay out the spiritual things for them? Do we show our kids a spiritual plan of how to grow up spiritually? Or do we just let them raise themselves? Do we encourage them to pursue Jesus Christ? I, I mean, I think about the years um, that, that I've been allowed to be a part of youth camp. I think this year will be like 14 or 15 years I've been allowed to go. And you know, one of the number one things that I see kids struggle with at youth camp is that when they come home, they're gonna have, they, they feel the desire and they know they have some friends they need to get rid of. They know they have some people they need to stop hanging around because those people don't help them get closer to Jesus Christ. Well, Mom and Dad, have you ever encouraged your kid to stop hanging out with those people? Have you ever said, hey, listen, I know that's a difficult de decision. What can I do to help you make the decision? Amen. We're supposed to be helping our, our, helping our kids, helping our children pursue Jesus Christ. We can't get to Him and leave them behind. That's, that's not success. If you get really close to Jesus and don't bring your family with you, that's failure. I mean, that's, that's missing an opportunity. That's missing out on the next generation. Preacher talks about, on a regular basis, about raising up the next generation. Well, guess what? It's on us that are in our 30s and 40s that have kids and 50s like, to, to start bringing our kids with us, to start making sure our kids don't miss out on what we've seen. I don't want my kids to go, well, I remember Dad talking about the great revival that he was a part of. I remember Dad talking about the Holy Spirit coming down. I, no, I want my kids to be at a jubilee and watch the presence of God come down and feel the presence of God and see God move in a service and see, see you know, the entire church come forward to an altar. I want to see, I want my kids to see what I've had the opportunity to see. Amen. 
I want my kids to know how awesome my God is and how awesome my Jesus is because of what He's done for me so that he, they, they can know they can put their trust in Him too. Not just for salvation, but for everyday life. For every aspect of their life, for every walk of their life. That they can know that they can have fellowship with Him just like I can. That, they, that He wants to hear from them just like He wants to hear from you and I. But that's what the devil says. The devil says, hey, leave your kids. Just, just you know, leave your kids, stay in the land. And the last thing I want to say is in uh, verse number 24. Exodus 10, 24. And Pharaoh called unto Moses and said, Go, ye serve the Lord. Only let your flocks and your herds be stayed. Let your little ones also go with you. And let your little ones also go with you. The last thing the devil says is, Go, but don't invest in it. He says, leave your heart here, and you go out, do whatever it is you need to do, but, but leave your stuff here, because where your stuff is, there will your heart be also. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. That's what Jesus said. The devil wants you to leave your stuff behind so that he knows he'll have something to draw you back to it. Because see, what the Lord's asking us for is 100% commitment. He's not asking us for 25%. He's not asking us for 50%. He's not asking us for 75, 80, even 90%. The Lord wants us to be all in. And you know what that means? That means giving the Lord every part of your life. That means letting the Lord make a decision over the bass boat. That means letting the Lord make a decision over the hunting trip. Letting the Lord make a decision over... Whatever it is in your life, whatever, whatever events you have going on, Lord, is this something I should be a part of? Lord, is this a business I should invest in? Is this a project that I should be a part of? Is this a person that I should be associated with? Lord, every aspect of my life, I need you to help me and know what I need to do in my life. The problem is, is we think we know as much as he does. And you know what? I, we are so good as Bible believers because we know the Bible better than most, that we can get away with just gently twisting what God says and nobody else knows about it. But you know about it in your heart and the Lord knows about it. He knows and you know that you haven't completely committed all the way. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. A, a little leaven destroys the whole entire thing. God wants 100% commitment, and the devil just wants you to give the Lord 99. Just hold a little bit back so that you've got somewhere to go back to when you get tired of serving God. You know, I mean, we need a, we need a fallback plan. I mean, what if pursuing God doesn't work out? What am I going to fall back on? That's what the devil says. That's what the devil says. What, what, if, what if this doesn't go the way you want it to? What are you going to fall back on? What if, what if God calls you to go to Bible school? What if God calls you to go to the missionary, mission field? What are you going to fall back on if that's what he wants you to do? God doesn't have a fallback plan. Because when you're in fellowship with the Lord and walking with the Lord, there's no need to worry about falling. The only reason you fall is because you make your own dumb mistake. Because you step out of fellowship and do something you shouldn't do. You sin. You have a brain fart and, you know... Think something you're not supposed to think, which I don't know about you, but that happens a whole lot. And, but God is asking us to give him 100% effort. He's not asking for 100% perfection. He's asking for 100% of our effort. He wants to know that we want him. Because when we want him, he wants us. He's not going to force us to serve him. He's giving us the opportunity to serve him. And we have an opportunity to do something that... Everybody from Genesis to the beginning of the church didn't have an opportunity to do, and that's walk with Jesus Christ on a daily basis. He gave us a Holy Spirit that we can stay in fellowship with Him. He gives us an opportunity because He desires fellowship with, you, with us. When you go through the Bible and you see the effort God puts into having fellowship with His creation, having fellowship with you and I, you can't help but know He wants to fellowship with you and I. He died on the cross for us is, what he, is the ultimate demonstration of what He wants for us to, to have fellowship with us. He gives us salvation free and says, if you want a fellowship, it's going to cost you something. It's going to cost you some effort in your life 
you're going to have to lay aside your burdens. You're going to have to lay aside your desires, and you're going to have to pursue me with 100% effort. And that's what he's asking for in our Christian lives tonight. He's asking us to say, you know what? I'm tired of letting the world have its way. I'm tired of letting my flesh have its way. I'm tired of letting the devil have its way. I'm going to pursue him. The Lord wants us to, to walk with him. But when you choose to walk with the Lord, like I said in the beginning, don't get the idea that just because the moment you decide to walk with the Lord, all of a sudden you're going to enter some other level. No, it's going to be one step at a time. It's going to be a marathon. I don't know how many of you have ever run long distances, but when you start to run a long distance, like if you haven't run much, when you run the first 100 yards, in your mind you're like, I've got to have gone at least a half a mile. And you look down and you're like, oh, wait, what? I've only done 300 steps? What? I, no, this can't be right. And then you go a few more steps. And then, but if you keep running, you get further and further away from the starting point. And before you know it, you have gone five miles because you continue to take one step after another step after another step. God's not asking us to sprint. He's asking us to walk with him. He's asking us to fellowship with him. He's asking us to spend just some spend our lives with him, spend each and every day with him, fellowship with him, talking to him throughout the day. And the devil's doing everything he can in, in, in his power to pull us in the opposite direction, to, to draw our flesh, to draw our desires away from what God wants us to pursue. And we need to be aware of that in our Christian lives. We need to be aware that just because we've chosen to pursue God doesn't mean it's going to go 100% perfect. It doesn't mean it's going to be a bed of roses. It doesn't mean that everything's going to happen just the way we want it to happen. No, you have to let go of all your expectations when you follow Jesus Christ. Because when you decide on a certain expectation, like I talked about in the very beginning with a construction schedule, when I lay out a construction schedule, Brother Brad and I have discussed construction schedules for the last year and a half, and nothing has met any deadline that we've ever set. And you go, that's because you're a horrible contractor. Maybe so. But I believe it's because we haven't, we have, I believe we've hit every deadline God wanted us to hit. It wasn't my deadline, it was his deadline. Because every step of the way, when we finish something, he has already provided for the next step. And that's how your Christian life is. Finish the place where you are first before you move on to the next place. Don't get frustrated because you're not here yet. Be content where God has you and finish where God has you and then let him, provide the op let him open the door to the next place he wants you to get to. And I hope that'll encourage you tonight. I hope that'll help you to think about your walk with the Lord and know that it's, it's not this get there in a hurry and know that, yeah, there, there are some things you're going to have to fight against. There are some parts of you that, that you need to sit down and take stock of in your own Christian life and go, you know what, what can I do better now? Lord, what can I give up? What can I add? What can I do to improve to get closer to you? When's the last time you sat down with the Lord and just asked the Lord those questions? When you said, Lord, what can I do to get closer to you today? What is it that you'd like to see me give up in my life? What is it you'd like to see me add in my life? Who, who can I help today? Who can I, who can I minister to? Show me an open door where you want me to go. If you'll ask him, I promise you he will show you those open doors. If you'll talk to him, he will show you where he wants you to go and give you the direction and lead you in the way you want to be led. But we have to ask and we have to pursue. I hope that will help tonight. Let's close with a word of prayer.